Hi there. Closing technologies. What is it? Maybe it's this handsome Renault Trezor for $3 million. The honeycombs on the hood are designed to cool the batteries, and a charge indicator is located in place of the neck of a fuel tank. Or maybe not. In fact, closing technologies reduce the need for resources, including human resources. Such technology leads to the folding of individual specialties or entire industries. And here, everything seems to be clear. Firstly, you need to feel sorry for the workers who work in the auto giant plants or in the field of hydrocarbon production. And most importantly, do not forget to feel sorry for the owners of these corporations. After all, they and their poor families will probably have nothing to eat if technology appears that makes their production obsolete. Actually, this already happened in the past, a little over 100 years ago, with one of the creators of the modern world, the Serb Nikola Tesla. It is to him that we owe electricity using alternating current. But the main business of Tesla was the Wardenclyffe project. It was a station for transmitting over enormous distances not only messages, but also energy. Tesla's authority in the world was enormous. He argued for many years that wireless transmission is a thing of the near future. Tesla in the 1890s claimed that the Earth itself in the upper atmosphere could be used for such a miracle transmission, and he proved his point by experiments. He believed that in this way, it is possible to combine a long-distance communication system with the transmission of electricity without wires. In 1901, Tesla tried to interest J.P. Morgan, the leader of the Manhattan financial elite. He told Morgan that he was capable of building a transatlantic communication between New York and London for $150,000. Morgan agreed to give this money for the creation of the company, where he would get 51% of the shares and the rights to many inventor patents. With these funds, Tesla bought 200 acres of land in the vicinity of New York and began to build a station with a fancy tower there. And suddenly, as if by accident, everything went awry. Morgan stopped financing the project and demanded that the scientist invest his own money, and he was not going to give up control over the 51% of the company's shares. Tesla began to finance the construction from his own pocket, but continued bombarding Morgan with letters with humiliating requests for another $150,000. But Morgan, not giving up control of the project, demanded that the scientist himself look for money elsewhere. Now let's turn our attention to Bernard Baruch, an American financier, stock investor, statesman, and political consultant. He once told Morgan, listen, this guy is crazy. He wants to give free electrical energy to everyone, and we won't be able to install our meters. We need to stop supporting him. Now we would call Nikola Tesla naive. Did he not understand with whom he was dealing? After all, even 10 years before the relationship with the owners of the monopolies, he described in one of the magazines how he had created a reservoir of electricity energy in the earth, and that it was the beginning of the end of all energy monopolies. No wonder they say that geniuses are not of this world. As a wholly owned capitalist, Morgan existed by controlling prices, distributing energy, and preserving the working class in the interest of gigantic monopolies. Electricity, according to the wire principle, promised Morgan and other oligarchs huge profits, expanding the demand for non-ferrous metals, from which wires were made, and for rubber, from which insulation was made. Guggenheim's, Baruch's, and Morgan himself have invested heavily in copper mining in Alaska. But what about Tesla? A brilliant scientist fought for his project to the end, drowning in debt and slipping into poverty. Hope appeared in 1905 when the genius of electrical engineering found an investor, financier Henry Frick. But Morgan tore off this deal. Tesla lost his purchase land. Creditors stole unique equipment and the tower was blown up in 1917. Of course, this was not about money. $300,000 at that time was a large amount of money, but for Morgan and Astor, Tesla's previous investor, $300,000 is a drop in the bucket. Astor easily paid over half a million dollars for his yacht, and Morgan spent several times more on works of art. And there is another such episode. In 1965, the experiences of a Canadian scientist who achieved success in launching satellites into space in the cheapest way were reported with enthusiasm. He took the old 16-inch cannon of the coastal defense, 
bore the barrel to a larger caliber and shot it with a thin and long projectile with an arrow-shaped plumage. A ceiling washer was put on it just for the caliber of the gun, which flew away when the projectile left the barrel. Thanks to this, the shell accelerated to such a speed that it went into space. The man was Gerald Vincent Bull, a man with a tragic fate. Back in the 1960s, Bull realized that flying into space on rockets was a hell of a wasteful and unreasonable task. To bring a tiny payload into orbit, they build expensive towers that burn down forever. Two of the three missile stages are spent on overcoming the first 500,000 feet. In 1961, Bull managed to persuade the US military to give him a coastal defense instrument and some equipment for his project on the island of Barbados. Four years of work under the Martlet program, lengthening the barrel of a gun, and now the Bull's projectile reached a height of 500,000 feet. The scientists managed to invent an ingenious system that gradually dispersed the projectile in the barrel. This means that it has become possible to put equipment into the shell without the risk of its destruction when fired. In fact, Bull paved the second way into space, offering the world a launch method that was dozens of times cheaper than a rocket. But in 1966, the Department of Defense of Canada stopped funding the Martlet program. The Americans transferred Bull to a training ground in the town of Yuma, Arizona. From here, in November of 1966, the shell soared to a height of 600,000 feet. Unexpectedly, in 1967, the Americans also refused to finance the program. But why? Could it be the cost of putting one pound of cargo into a basic orbit? It couldn't be, because it decreased the cost by 20 times. In 1972, Bull created the GC-45 howitzer, which surpassed all the howitzers of the world in range. Bull's invention was taken into service in South Africa, with the secret assistance of the CIA, which, however, did not prevent the Americans from putting Bull in jail for illegally arming the racist regime of Boers in South Africa. When he got out of prison, it was Boers who saved him from poverty by paying $2 million for the howitzer he developed. Saddam Hussein in 1988 invited Bull to Baghdad to make a super gun capable of throwing shells either into space or to the other end of the earth. And Bull almost created this weapon if he hadn't been shot in Brussels on March 22, 1990. The person who killed him is still unknown. But there is an even more dangerous thing. The way to extract energy by connecting the atomic nuclei of a substance, not in huge super expensive reactors at huge temperatures and monstrous pressure, but by exposing the substance to simple things, ultrasound or an electromagnetic field at room temperature. If such low cost plants were available, the cold fusion reactors the size of a suitcase could be installed everywhere, receiving energy that costs almost nothing. After that, one could safely dismantle drill rigs, borehole pumps, and pipelines for scrap, restoring the environment. Cold thermonuclear fusion was first discussed in 1989 when the American scientist Stanley Pons and his English colleague Martin Flashman stated that they were able to launch a thermonuclear reaction at room temperature. However, the excitement quickly subsided. Serious laboratories did not confirm the phenomenon. But, in May 2004, a sensational event happened. The U.S. Department of Energy suddenly ordered a reanalysis of research results in the field of cold fusion. Official physicists met this decision with violent protests, but this did not change anything. A triumphant interview with Popular Mechanics magazine was given by one of the adherents of the idea of cold fusion, the head of the New Energy Foundation, Gene Malaw, who continued research in his laboratory and held annual seminars for specialists in alternative energy. Four days later, on May 14, 2004, Malaw was found murdered by stabs in the neck and head. These examples are very eloquent because they threaten to break huge production cycles, which have invested many billions of dollars. Perhaps in the modern world, it's considered good practice to obstruct revolutionary discoveries and strangle them in the bud, instead of supporting and helping them. Selfish interest, pedantry, stupidity, and ignorance go on the attack, condemning scientists to bitter trials and suffering to heavy struggle for existence. Such is the fate of enlightenment. This was written by Tesla in 1905, 
as if about our days. But the quote does not end there. Everything that was great in the past was first ridiculed, scorned, repressed, and humiliated, so that it later could be reborn with more power, defeated with even greater triumph. Who knows, maybe in the near future we will see the triumphal appearance of cold fusion plants, fuel-free generators, and plants operating on natural electricity. Or maybe all these breakthrough things are interesting and too powerful for this world? Or maybe there is no longer a need for huge factories with thousands of workers who are unhappy anyway, and they themselves are already using such things. Let's discuss this in the comments. Can we really choose between one or another technology? Or is all that we have available to us is the choice between one or another brand of car running on fossil fuels? What do you think? And that's all for today. Put like if you like this video. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more.